Um, the, the author of this book, of course, is Jude, the other brother of Jesus. Remember, we did the book of James, who was one of the brothers of Jesus. And now Jude was the other brother of Jesus. Um, and uh, also, that means he was the brother of Jude. This is a general epistle. It's written to the church at large. And Jude wrote, like many of the apostles, to warn the believers of false teachers. Like today, the church was targeted for destruction by the enemy who used false believers to infiltrate and to destroy the church within. Outline of this book uh, it begins with an introduction of Jude's purpose and warnings on false teachers. Then he moves to use many of the same examples that the apostles used to give examples of God's judgment on rebellion and sin. And then he offers us attributes of false apostles and reminds uh, us of prophecies concerning judgment on the ungodly and a reminder of Christian duties. Uh, it's a small, short book, but it's a powerful book. In verse 1, uh, chapter 1, which there is only one chapter, by the way, verse 4, we read, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who... Change the grace of our, of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. And then verse 22 and 23, he says, Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. And pretty much that covers Jude. <laughs> sure. Now, if you go back and you read it, you'll find that it has a lot more content. And it's a very powerful book, actually. But uh, just for a, a brief survey overview, that's about what we've got. Now we're going to go to um, page 60, the book of Revelation, the great prophecy. The book of Revelation uh, has overwhelmed many people through the years because they try to make it into something that is probably not intended to be. The book itself tells the believers what it is in verse 1 through 3. It's scripture says that the revelation of Jesus Christ, that's what it is, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Notice references here to the time of future tense. This is a direct statement that the book is telling of future events. Many try to explain away revelation because they don't understand or they're afraid to believe the things contained in the book. There's nothing implied in this book to lead the reader to uh, to lead the reader away from a literal translation, changing the meaning because we can't understand the text is presumption, implying that God is able to do only that which we can understand. When God speaks, God's words are not based upon our own understanding or ability or our uh, comprehension. God's word is based upon His ability. And he doesn't have any problems there. Amen? Amen. Um, in reading this verse, the believer does well to remember Peter's words from his second letter, reminding the church not to put their own limits on God's timing. And uh, just as a refresher, we're going to read that. That's chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, 2 Peter. He says, but, not, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. All right. Um, the particular writing style of Revelation is a mixed style. The book is a standard narrative. Much of the book is allegorical in style. Perhaps uh, this is because John received the vision in pictures. Or perhaps it was his inability to describe more contemporary technologies 
and events, and it caused him to use pictorial descriptions to, decide, to describe what he saw. In other words, he didn't understand what he saw, and because it was, it was, he was seeing things that were futuristic, and to him, what he saw, he described it in the terminology of what he understood in his day and time, and he did the best he could with it. In any case, we can treat this book as any other scripture. Literal language interpreted literally. Allegorical language as represented of real persons or events. Be willing to accept what you don't readily understand at its actual meaning. As surely we all can acknowledge that there is much in the spirit realm that we have yet to learn. Basically, what I'm saying here is, is we believe the Bible is literal. We believe that God says what he means and he means what he says. Um, there are all kinds of philosophies out there. One time um, back, oh goodness, 20 years ago, Bishop Earl Paul came out with a book. And he had his vision, his revelation, and God supposedly had given him an interpretation of the book of Revelation. And you know what? I read that book. It was very interesting. But uh, it was all allegorical to the extreme extent. And uh, it took, the, took every bit of the literal out of it. And basically it was kingdom theology is what it was. Which is totally unbiblical and unscriptural. And, uh, um, you know, I mean, it was, if you want to read fiction, it was wonderful. But it wasn't the Bible. And it wasn't right. And, you know, even though Earl Paul... Uh, I'm sure was a good man, uh, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't long after that he got arrested for being a pedophile. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, he was wrong. That's what I'm saying. You know, the reason I bring him up is because he became very, very prominent during that period of time. He was on television all the time, and he was very popular, very famous, and sold, I'm sure sold thousands, probably maybe hundreds of thousands, I don't know. Of that book. But you got to go back to the fact that God says what he means and he means what he says. He don't need nobody's help interpreting him. Amen? Um, if, there, if there's a communication problem somewhere, it's on our part, not on God's part. Amen. So the author here is John. John addresses his letter to the one who reads. In verse 3. And the one who hears, uh, thus implying that this is a general letter to the church. In verse 4, John addresses specifically the seven churches in the province of Asia, which are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These churches were in the unique position of being personally addressed by the Lord in the message brought by John. In chapter 3 and verse 22, the scripture says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So we see that this message was given to John as a dual audience. Specific letters to each church describe their spiritual condition. And Jesus' own direction for them. Then John says by the Holy Spirit, He who has an ear. Showing that God wanted all believers to receive what the Lord was saying to each of the churches, the message applies to all of us. Uh, John's purpose in writing was simply compulsion by the Holy Spirit. He was commanded to write and he obeyed. He didn't set out to write a great prophecy. Uh, the very nature of prophecy is that its origin is not the writer. They simply act as a messenger of a message that has been given them. All scripture is inspired by God and in fact originates in God. But prophecy has no pre-planned intentions. It's simply received and reported. In all of John's writings, his consistent theme is the love of God. How like the heart of God he must have been to be chosen to receive such a powerful revelation of God's heart for the church, a view of heaven and insider information as to the end of the age. This is also the guy who's known as John the Beloved. So he had a heart for God and, uh, and a heart for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he was highly favored and trusted. He being exiled to the island of Patmos, is, which is where he received this revelation. Again, that's one of those circumstances where you can say, Oh, how unfortunate that the devil had him exiled. On the other hand, you can say, Oh, what a plan of God that he was set apart and put in a quiet place for a time 
that may not have been convenient to his flesh, but God was able to reveal to him something that has <coughs> forever profoundly impacted the nations and the church. Amen. That's how you want to look at it. Praise God. Uh, given an outline here, the book can be divided into a series of visions that John received while exiled by the Roman government on the island of Patmos, which is a, which is a part of Greece. There are two main sections, the introduction and the messages to the churches, and then the vision of the end times and what is to come. The introduction and messages to the churches, we'll look at that first. John introduces his purpose, and he lays a historical foundation in verses 1 through 8. Um, vision number 1, he sees the glorified Christ and command to write, the seven, write to the seven churches. And this is chapter 1, basically. Then in verse 14, the scripture says, his, excuse me, his head and his hair, he's describing Jesus, by the way, were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. And then verse 16, it says, in his, in his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. So revealing what he saw. And is his description of the glorified Christ that he saw. So if you want to know what Jesus looks like, this is what he looks like. Now, I don't know what this deal is about all these frail-looking, pitiful little people on crosses. That ain't Jesus. You know, in the first place, if, if you wanted to try to visualize what Jesus might have looked like on the cross, he was a strong man. You know, he was a carpenter. He wasn't no frail little puny guy. So you would have seen a more bulky guy on the cross. But in the second place, that ain't what he looks like today. He's not on the cross anymore. This is what he looks like right here. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. Are you getting a different picture now? You know, that's what you need right here in churches. If you want to put Jesus' picture, you need something that will scare the fire out of people. Amen? No little old sissy man hanging on a cross. Jesus wasn't no little old sissy man. Amen? He had, he had in his right hand, and, you, and, I, and I'm picturing a big old muscular arm with a tight grip. And he's got seven hot, fiery stars in his hand. And bless God, he ain't letting go of them. Hello? The ordinary man had let go of a match. And he's got seven stars in his hand. Are you getting this? This is what I'm talking about. And out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged uh, two or double-edged sword, and his face is like the sun shining in all its brilliance. It's burning you to look at it. My goodness. Woo. My, my, my. People, somehow, I don't know... I'm going to blame the Catholic Church for a lot of this. But anyway, anyway, somehow, somehow people got the wrong picture. You know what I mean? <laughs> Messages to the churches. In chapter 2 and 3, uh, he speaks to the Ephesus church, or the church at Ephesus, <coughs> backslidden church in 2, 1 through 7. And to Smyrna, uh, it's a poor but a truly rich, spiritually speaking, Pergamum, the church in an evil environment. In Thyatira, good works but false prophets. In Sardis, the dying church. In Philadelphia, weak but faithful. Uh, really, Philadelphia, there's really, it's the only one that really, there's nothing really, really negative said about it. Other than it, 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 there's an implication that it might be a little weak, but there's no real sin addressed there. And then with Laodicea, I don't know what the deal is with this mouth thing. Uh, the church of Laodicea was lukewarm and self-satisfied. In verse 13, he says, I know where you live, where, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. And then in verse 8, he says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no man can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Praise God. 
You know, um, powerful testimony is what you're really reading here. That third, uh, chapter 3, verse 8, that's referring to the church of uh, Philadelphia. And then uh, chapter 2, verse 13 is addressing Pergamum. And so, uh, just to give you an idea there. And then the second vision he has is the vision of the heavenly worship. And this is chapters 4 through 6. And the vision of God is of God upon the throne and the worship of the angels and the elders and the four living creatures in verses 1 through 11. And the scripture says in verse 1, And after this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Keyword, after. Okay? And then verses 4, 2 through 5 says, And at once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald, encircled the throne, surrounding the throne, where 24 other thrones... And seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and, and thunders of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. There are seven spirits of God. Okay? So you begin to see a picture here beginning to unfold. And then it says, The scroll, the Lamb, Jesus, and the only one worthy to open the scroll. And we see the worship of the elders and the angels continue. In verses uh, 4 through 14 of chapter 5. And then verse 9 says, And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation. And then the opening of the first six seals of the scroll and what happened as a result of each one in chapter 6. And there's the breakdown here. In verse 2, we see the first seal opened. And you have the rider of your, the white horse who is a conqueror. <clears throat> the second seal is the rider on the red horse. And he's a destroyer of peace. The third seal is a rider on a black horse, which is the inflation. The fourth seal is the rider on a pale horse, which is the plague and famine. You have your fifth seal, the prayer of, uh, of the white robe martyrs in, in verse 10. And the sixth seal is the collapse of heavens and earth in 12 through 17. And reading um, from verse 6, uh, dealing with inflation, And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. And then in verse 10, which would deal with the martyrs and the prayers of the martyrs, they called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Mm, praise God. And then vision number three is the vision of the 144 and the multitudes. And this is found in chapter 7. In verse 1, we see the four angels holding back the four winds of the earth. And this is God in, in protecting the people. Verse 5 through 8, you see the tribes of Israel listed. And then in verse 9, the multitude comes from every nation. Verse 10, the worship. And then in verse 14, uh, the, the question is presented, who are these? Those, and then the response is those who have come out of the great tribulation. And in verse 15 through 17, uh, the comforts of the overcomers. And verses 9 and 10 says, And after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, before the throne. And in front of the Lamb they were wearing white robes, and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And now the fourth vision. Seven angels and seven trumpets. And this is chapters 8 through 11. And this is the opening of the seventh seal, the seal of, uh, of silence in heaven, uh, which is, is referred to in verse 1. Then you have the seven angels and their trumpets in verse 2. You have the prayers of the saints and God's response to that in verses 3 through 5. Verses 4 through 5 says, The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God and the angel's hand. Then he, uh, excuse me, then the angel 
took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and earthquake. And then uh, the angels prepared to, prepare to the sound of the trumpets in verse 6. And the first trumpet is uh, the presenting of the hail and fire in verse 7. And then the second trumpet, uh, the mountains in the, in the sea and a third of the fish die. The third trumpet, one third of the fresh water turns bitter. The fourth trumpet, one third of light is destroyed. Fifth trumpet, scorpions come up from the abyss. The sixth trumpet, four angels uh, released to kill one third of mankind. The angels that stood upon the land in the sea holding the scroll, he shouted, and the seven thunders spoke. But John was not allowed to write the words of the seven thunders. And that's in chapter 10. And then the announcement of the seventh angel to sound his trumpet, there will be no more delay. The mystery of God will be accomplished. And verse 7 says this, But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. And in chapter 10, verses 8 through 11, John commands to eat the scroll. And then further prophecy measuring the temple of God uh, is in chapter 11, 1 through 2, and then the two witnesses that... Uh, uh, the two witnesses that will lie in the street it, are referred to in chapter 11, 3 through 14. And also uh, the seven, seventh trumpet kingdoms of the earth have become the kingdoms of our God. Worship of the elders and the thunderous openings of the temple of God. Uh, verse 19 actually says, And then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and a great hailstorm. Oh, you know, um, this is big deal here. This is big stuff, amen. And then the fifth vision. This is the woman, the man child, and the dragon in chapter 12. So what we see here in picture in chapter 12 is the woman in labor, uh, pursued by the dragon. The male child is then born, and God swept him up into heaven. The woman is fled to the desert in hiding from the dragon. And Michael fights the dragon and hurls him to the earth. In verse 10, the scripture says, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. Authority, and then, then authority of Christ is announced in chapter 12, verse 10 and 12. And the fury of the dragon rage against the believers. Then the sixth vision comes forth. And this is the dragon and the beast deceive the nations. Uh, deceiving the nations in chapter 13 and 14. And this is where the dragon seeks vengeance on mankind and empowers the beast. Uh, in verse 2 it says, The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. And the dragon gave the bear his power and his throne and great authority. And uh, in verse 13, it's the false miracle healing of the fatal wound, and the world worships the beast and the dragon. And verse 8 of 13 says, And all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. <clears throat> and then 9 and 10 of chapter 13 reminds us as a reminder to the saints to be patient. As the second beast uh, is given further authority in the world and, and the presentation of the mark of the beast, the number 666. And then we have the heavenly worship of the Lamb and His redeemed. And then there's the warning of the angel. The, uh, he proclaims the gospel and warns the inhabitants of the earth against worshiping the beast in 14. And then in the second part of chapter 14, we have the great harvest of souls for the kingdom of God. And verse 14 says, And I looked, and there before me was a white cloud. And seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with the crown of gold and his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. This, this is called the second harvest, the wrath of God. And this is chapter 14, 17 through 20. And then we move to the seventh vision, 
This is the seven last plagues. This is inclusive of chapter 15 and 16. And this is, begins with the glorious worship by the overcomers from the tribulation. And then it, it uh, moves into procession of the seven angels carrying the seven bowls and the seven last plagues in verses 5 through 8. Verse 6 says, Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chest. We have the outpouring of the bowls of wrath. First, the painful sores on those with the mark of the beast in verse 2. In verse 3, we have the second sea turned into blood. And then uh, secondly, the sea is turned into blood. Then thirdly, the rivers turned to blood in verse 4. In verse 5 and 6, the scripture says, And then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in these, you are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One. Because you have so judged, for they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. Fourthly, the sun scorches the men with fire, verse 8, 16. And then fifthly, darkness uh, comes. In verse 10 and 60, the Euphrates is dried up and covered with demon frogs, demonic frogs. Verse, verse 15 says, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. And then the seventh, there is a great earthquake that splits Jerusalem and topples the cities of the earth. And that's verse 17, actually through 21. And then, then we have the eighth vision. This is the angel explaining the punishment of Babylon the great. The great harlot has been interpreted as both the religious system of the world and its political system. And either of these interpretations may be correct or both may be correct. Um, and it really, it all depends on who you ask as to what people believe. But uh, in chapters 1 and 2 of chapter, or verses 1 and 2 of chapter 17, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters with her the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. And verses 5 and 6 says, This title was written on her forehead, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of the prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of saints, the, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. And then 9 and 10 of this 17th chapter, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. Um, they are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. Mm. Vision 9. This is the celebration that takes place in heaven. This is found in chapter 19. And... Uh, this is the roaring of the multitude in worship, verses 1 through 10, and then verses 11 through 20, uh, verse 3, the revealing of the king of kings and his final defeat of the devil. And verse 19 and 20 says, And then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. <clears throat> This is the first resurrection and the release of the devil in verses 4 through 10 of chapter 20. And then the white throne judgment in verse 11 through 15. We have our tenth vision. This is the vision of the new heaven, the new earth, and new Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, uh, chapter is um, 21 and 22. The new Jerusalem bride in verses 1 through 4. And verses 3 and 4 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Praise God. Uh, verse 5 through 7, He declares, I am making everything new. 
In verses 9 through 27, he gives a description of the holy city. Verse 10 and 11 says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. In verses 1 through 5 of 22, uh, we see the river and the trees in the New Jerusalem. And 6 through 21, we see the blessings on those who believe and obey the words of this book. And this is a powerful promise. It says, The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, the remaining part of your study guide is just resource material. It's just descriptions of the cities that we've read and studied if you want to know a little bit of background. Um, it's not something that we'll go over in class. Anybody have any questions? Comments? Okay. That concludes our lesson for today. We're finishing early. But the day of the Lord will come like Thank a you, thief. God. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. He's saying here, it isn't going to happen. You know? And when it does, it's going to happen. Like he said, it was going to happen. Is it going to be for real? And then finally, in verse 15, he says, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul has already wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. In other words, in other words, um, I'm putting this in my own words, but we shouldn't be complaining that the Lord has delayed. The reason he has is because people are still getting saved. Yeah. You know? And even though we, we would love to see him come quickly and return, at the same time, thank the Lord that a few more people are getting saved. A few more people are getting saved. A few more people are getting saved. Hallelujah. God is merciful. He's patient. He's an awesome God, isn't he? Thank you, Jesus. Okay, let's look at first letter of John. Uh, John, the apostle, John um, is the author here. His name uh, doesn't appear in this epistle. However, there's a lot of evidence in the writing itself to indicate that uh, he is John the Beloved uh, and he is the author. The style of the letter is consistent with the Gospel of John and references to seeing and hearing show the author's contact with the Lord. The early church tradition was that the church agreed on the authorship of John. This letter is addressed to the church at large and evidenced by its total lack of personal greetings and uh, comments. John's purpose in writing this letter is to instill in the believers a sense of surety in the things of God. Those things they had already received. <clears throat> he intended to increase their joy. He conveyed with language... Um, these things he conveyed with language that was strong and assuring. His second main purpose was to combat the false Gnostic teaching, which was a dangerous heresy attack in the early church. He emphasized that each of the believers had full access to God and to knowledge of Him. He includes the test of a false teacher that, so that those that deny that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Uh, just to kind of uh, give an explanation on Gnosticism, uh, it was a teaching based on Greek philosophy and Eastern mysticism. It had two basic tenets: a search for a higher knowledge that's not gained through normal learning and that normal Christians could not attain, and the belief that all matter is bad or evil and all spirit is good. The search for higher knowledge was pursued through philosophical means, not based on the scriptures. These teachers pulled themselves, uh, pulled these teachers pulled members away from the church and separated them from the regular body of believers, claiming special spirituality, and only they could obtain this special knowledge. The concept that matter was inherently evil forced the Christian, the Gnostics, to deny that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. God is good and therefore could not come in the form of man, made of flesh or matter. Both these teachings are based on the doctrines of demons. False teaching, teachings that sound high and spiritual, but in fact have no basis in the knowledge of God. So that's what Gnosticism is. It's nonsense. Um, but it was a very popular doctrine during the time of Christ. 
and it still rears its head from time to time, even now. Um, and so, uh, uh, presenting an outline for this particular book, God is life and light, is what he presents to us in chapters 1 and 2. He speaks about light manifested in Christ and the conditions of divine fellowship. He deals with accepting Christ as the atoning sacrifice and then following Christ's example in obedience, the message of true spiritual knowledge and overcoming the wicked one. Uh, powerful, actually, teaching. And then he speaks to uh, warning against love of the world and apostasy and remaining in the truth and counting on the Holy Spirit to teach you. And he talks about ab abiding, gives uh, confidence. And then just read a few of these scriptures. Verse 5, he says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Um, amen. And let's jump down to chapter 2, 26 through 27. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from you, from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Amen. Okay, and then secondly, he talks about God is righteous love. God's, he speaks to the fact that God's love manifests in our sonship. And uh, he speaks to the test of sonship, which is how we live. It's righteous living. Proves, it proves who our Father is, basically. The mark of a believer is brotherly love. So the way we live attests to who our Father is. And then the mark of, of the believer is uh, our brotherly love, the way we treat other people. And then love shown by sacrifice. Love is revealed by our willingness to give up for the benefit of other people. The result of love is assurance and answered prayer. Um, and that's powerful in itself, the result of love. How do we know that we're flowing in love? Because our life bears it out in, in, in fruit. We have assurance in our heart. And we have answered prayer that we're able to identify and recognize in our life. Faith and brotherly love are essential to fellowship with God. Um, fellowship with God isn't limited. It's limited to the fact that if we want to fellowship with God, we can be family minded. Faith and brotherly love. Amen. First John 3, 1 John 3.1 says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Amen? Amen. You don't recognize us because you didn't recognize Daddy. 3.3 3, John 1. First John, I mean. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Actions reveal what's on the inside. What that's saying. 310. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does, does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. That's pretty clear, you know. That's pretty clear. Um, and then he talks about spirit of truth, spirit of error, and how we tell the difference or how we test them. Faith in Jesus' incarnation is a test of the spirit of truth. Marks of the spirit of the Antichrist is what he deals with next. If you don't believe Jesus came in the flesh, you're a liar. That's what he says. I mean, I'm simplifying it, but that's what he says. You know, if you can't preach that and if you don't believe that, you ain't true. Pretty clear. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. That's real important. That is real important to Christian fundamental doctrine. Jesus, the Son of God, came in the flesh. The majority of false religions have a trouble with that. Results of divine love in the life of the believer. Chapter 4, divine love of Christ indicates regeneration. It's proof that you've been born again. Okay? People don't generally have agape love if they haven't been born again. 
love of believers, testimony of the world to the world of their salvation. Love drives out fear. Divine love kindles love for us. It, 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 it's remarkable that the thing that overpowers and, and, and forces out fear is love. But that's the way the kingdom of God works. Hmm. And faith without love, that's how it works. Faith worketh by love. Think about it. Faith and fear, total opposites. But in order for faith to work, you got to have love. And it's really powerful. That's what makes the kingdom of God so unique. Amen? Amen? 1 John 4, 10, 11 says, This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Do you know that sums up the whole kingdom and the whole work of God's church, His body? What's the mission of the church? Well, we're the body of Christ extended. So what would we do? We wouldn't expect the world to love us. We wouldn't expect the world to come to us. Our mission is to love the unlovable world. Just like God unloved us when we were unlovable. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. When we talk about faith and love, the power to overcome the world in chapter 5. Walk by, he talks about walking by faith and obedience, the divine witnesses to the gospel, eternal life and the gift of God, answers to prayer, dealing with brothers in sin, and believing in the fourfold knowledge. He says in verse 10, Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony of God has, gi given, has given about his son. And then also verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And let's get this second letter of John and we'll, I think it's break time, isn't it, Billy? Yeah. Yeah, we'll get this second letter of John. Um, again, this is written by John, and is, she is uh, the audience is the chosen lady. It's probably a metaphorical title for the church. It could be an actual person who was a friend of John. John wrote to uh, warn his friends to remain in love, the true test of faith in God, and to avoid false teachers. The outline presented here is, uh, first of all, divine truth and its relation to believers. He unites them in fellowship. Um, truth dwells, it talks about truth that dwells within them. Truth along with love characterizes greetings and obedience to it. It's the way to walk. In verse 6 he says, And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. He deals, secondly now, with worldly error, which has deceitfulness. It denies Christ. And he says that we must guard against it in verse 8. And then he talks about departing from the teachings of Christ and the danger of fellowship with these kind of followers. In verse 7, he says, There are many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as, the coming, as coming in the flesh, have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. And then in verse 10 and 11, he says, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. He says, don't have any part of him. Don't promote him and don't help him in their cause because you don't want to be a part of this type of ministry. And then finally, the third letter of John was written by John again, and his audience was Gaius, uh, who was a believer. John is encouraging his friend Gaius. He commends him for his consistent walk with the Lord, and he writes to correct improper attitudes um, of another leader in the church, Diotrephes. The actions to be corrected have to do with hospitality and proper treatment of fellow ministers. And just as a short one here also, Gaius was worthy of John's affection. He was a consistent Christian, and he was given to hospitality. And that's found in verses 1 through 6. And Diotrephes, he's another leader. He's self-centered, bigoted, and assuming improper authority. <clears throat> And Demetrius is a traveling minister. He's a guy that's worthy of respect. He's improperly treated by diatrophies. And uh, so uh, we see that in verse 12. And then the proper treatment of traveling evangelist, he, uh, he lays out in verse 7 and 8 and verse 11. In verse 8 he says, We ought therefore to show hospitality to such men so that we may work together for the truth. 
And then in verses 9 and 10, he says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. So, I, so if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, gossiping maliciously about us. Not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stop, stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. He wasn't a nice guy. You know, and uh, Paul basically called him on it and, uh, and corrected him on it. And so uh, dealt with the issue. And, of course, like in, in, in every issue like this, Paul is writing this letter and then making it available so that it becomes an example for others to learn from. Amen? So we're going to take a break and come back for what will probably be our last session. Maybe. <laughs> All right, let's take a break.